All right, good morning, everybody. We'll uh, get up and get going here. Uh, literally, this is the power hour. Uh, obviously, we got the good Chief Buchanan, uh, you know, kind of closing us up here a little bit, so we want to try to do our best to, to get you over to him to, to wrap up our day here today. But uh, one of my favorite classes is this one here, um, you know, talking about the first five minutes. And, and again, in, in context here, what I, what I don't want to have this be is uh, a, a battle between a sequential versus a simultaneous fire ground operation. So that this is just about when the yellow knob is pulled out of the dashboard for an engine, for a truck, for a rescue, for the incident commander, for the company officer, just a set of performance standards that, that again, we've had kind of homegrown, we've taken them from a lot of different places and things like that. And, and hopefully when I close things up here today and give you some resources, you guys can go back, you know, back at home, and you can take a look at your department and how your department operates. So, you know, what's missing here is the response piece. So, we're looking at everything from the time the yellow knob is pulled until we start to go to work. So, you know, everything that happens from alarm time, the turnout time, the response time, and things like that. Well, let's assume from this point on that all those things have happened as, as we go through the day here today. So. As we look at this, uh, th this is kind of a two-way street. Uh, I'm gonna got a, a few simulations built in here for you guys. Uh, let, let me get uh, <clears throat> the website up here for you. Uh, Thetrainingofficer.com, uh, right on top, you'll see the logo for the Montana Fire Conference right up on top. There's a Dropbox folder on there that has this presentation in it. And, and again, full disclosure, this is literally a four plus hour class that I've just you know chopped down just to kind of whet your appetite a little bit. I've got about, six or eight embedded simulations in here for you guys and in the Dropbox folder through the rest of the day today it, it was uploaded and still up up in the room here when I had to turn it off I've got about 20 other simulations that you guys can use back at home just to kind of walk through some sets and reps and, and think about that first arriving company and what they have to do to start to go to work to be successful on our fire ground and that so so that's our chore for the day today. So the trainingofficer.com, click on the Montana link, there's a drop box, grab all that stuff, and as always, you know, what's mine is yours, and I'll, I'll do my best to make sure that you guys have got the tools you need to, to be successful. So outcome-wise, we wanna look at this today. We wanna be able to look at the first five minutes of a working fire incident and apply the skills that we talk about here today, and again, Everybody's SOPs are different because everybody is, as he said yesterday, your manpower, your, you know, your personnel that you've got available, the response times, all those things are a little bit different. But what I want to be able to do here is, is answer the million dollar question, figure out what we want each member of a company, what their supervisors who are managing those companies do to, you know, again, what, what do we want them to be able to do in the street? And, and again, the assumption is we got a blank piece of paper and we're brain, brainstorming here today over a cup of coffee trying to figure out what the first engine does, what the first truck does. Uh, not about area ladders all the time, it's about just truck functions and those types of things. And we'll set up a, a real a basic template for that in just a little bit. And again, uh, fourth anniversary, right, of, of Chief Brunacini's passing. You know, it, you know, ultimately at the end of the day, it's to stop bad and cause good. You know, that, that, that really is where we want to go with it. So if we look at these two things, and if you look at the, you know, kind of my little carnival um, up, up in the top right-hand corner, uh, what, do, what do you think of that first picture on the top left in the, in the collage there? What do you think of this one up here? Or this one here? I, I see a couple of chuckles out there, right? But, but is that a big deal on the fire ground? That, that, that is a huge, almost irreversible series of errors that have happened on that fire ground that can have tremendous negative consequences. You know? So ju just think if that's the initial attack uh, engine there. If that's the initial attack engine with all that five inch hose that's charged up in the bed there, you, know, you guys know the math. It's a five inch line, you got a gallon per foot, you got 8.33 pounds per gallon, you know, so on and so on and so on. They can't un -F that fast enough to protect the guys who are on the inside who may be on that attack line working off of that tank water to establish that po positive water supply. So, you know, each one of those, and, you know, you can see the mess of hose, uh, you know, when all the kinks laid off uh, the back of that engine over there. You can see that big, gigantic pile of hose on those firefighters making that standpipe operation and things there. So the first five minutes, and the assumption is that those are all things that, that are happening upon initial arrival, as well as, you know, being able to do those things. We want to look and figure out what the effective fire ground looks like in those first five minutes to set up something like this. Now in the drop box, and this was Tinley Parks, and this is something that my command staff and I in the first uh, 60 days when I, uh, when I took the job there, we came up with, 
And what we came up with is we came up with four sets of parameters. And this really became our tool uh, for post-incident analysis and a little bit of an incident hot brief, uh, hot wash it at the, at, the, at the incident here. And what we tried to come up with, again, is a set of defined expectations for our company operations here. A training standard, it became the format of our incident action plan or our SOG as well as becoming an individual performance measure and a company performance measure. And we broke it into four areas. And, and, and again, in the context of how this was laid out, these were my expectations of chief of department to my firefighters and to my officers that to have an effective fire ground operation and, and what we had to do there, first five minutes of arrival, our engine companies must be able to do those things. First five minutes of arrival, our truck companies must be able to do those. First five minutes of arrival, our first due uh, company officer, we were a blue card department, so our first IC1 people had to do those things. And then finally, uh, our shift commanders or the IC2 persons, they had to do those things. So in the Dropbox is this document for you guys. So, you know, again, take our stuff off, put your stuff on, you know, get that verbiage to work for you guys. And, and you know, hopefully by the end of the day, th th this is where we're able to kind of take and, and, and drive, our, uh, drive our process here for the day today. Okay, so help me out here with just a couple of quick challenge questions just to, just, just to keep us moving here. How, how do you define a good fire ground operation? You know, kind of the one that after a, a good op, you know, the folks are high-fiving out in the front yard, you know, and not, not that dramatic, but what, 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 we, what is our measure of a good fire ground operation? Contained to the block of origin, uh, you know, nothing else burnt down other than the original fire. You know, I, I guess those would be some things, but what, what, what measures do you guys have in, internally in your departments now to say that we, we had a good stop today or we had a good operation uh, on that house fire on Main Street? Eddie had one this morning. What was, what was the good outcome there, Ed? They had a grab. Okay, you know, legitimate, you know, forced an entry, you know, you get, worked their way inside, pulled a victim out, got the victim to the hospital with a pulse, alive and breathing. Is that a good outcome? Probably some things that could have gone better, probably some things that, you know, there, there's room for improvement. But, you know, within your own department, you've got to come up with an answer for this in terms of what we feel, you know, is a good outcome in terms of what, you know, what, what, it, what that operation looks like. So anybody want to take a bite of this one yet? What do you think? I just want to identify operational goals. Okay. Okay. Fast water, you know, stay, uh, again, just, just those initial benchmarks, and, and that, that's what this is all about, is, is setting up those initial benchmarks to, to come up with a good, solid answer for, uh, for the question here. So, <clears throat> what safety systems, and this one I like a lot, I really like this question here. What, what type of safety systems do you think have to be present at your fire scene, um, again, at any level? Is, is the person inside and, and when making, you know, make, making the stretch or doing the primary search or whatever we're doing on the inside? What do you want behind you in order to say, yeah, I, I felt pretty safe doing my job because I knew these safety systems were behind me? And what, what are some of those safety systems that you'd want to have present? RIT team, right? A RIC team, right? What, what else? Accountability system in place and functioning, right? You know, people, we know where our people, you know, their supply, all the, all, you know, things like that, right? Safety officer? Redundancy and resources? You know, if, uh, you know to, to steal the blue card term, you've got on-deck personnel where you can tap somebody in if somebody has to tap out or if you have to reassign or reinforce a position. You know, would all those be good safety systems to have in place? Okay, and, you know, in all honesty, can we say that we do that effectively at all of our incidents? You know, I, I know we may have a tremendous time curve on getting those additional resources to the scene and things like that, so obviously some of this has to be measurable and scalable according to the type and the size of the department that you have. And then here, uh, you know, may, maybe we can say this is a Vegas kind of thing here or whatever, but, you know, within the confines of the room here, I, I want us to kind of talk and think freely here. What, what are we good at tactically? You know, what, what can you say, hey, our department, you know, you know the, the Tinley Park Fire Department is exceptionally skilled at primary search or at initial hose line advancement, skills like that. And conversely, well, what, what, what don't we do so well? Can, can you answer those questions? And you don't have to right now, but you know, again, just, just in, in, in your own mind's eye, I, I think there's an opportunity for us to kind of look at what we do you know, within our departments and what we're good at and what we need to work on, on some of those skills. And, and as this blueprint comes together with this initial attack stuff and, and kind of benchmarking how effective we're being, that, that, that's where the answers to all these questions are gonna be important for us. Okay, so your turn here. So from here, <clears throat> 
What are the primary responsibilities of an engine company on the fire ground? You guys have to answer this or we can't move on. What are we going to do here? What, what does the engine exist to do on your fire ground? I'm sorry? Aggressive initial attack. Okay, initial attack. Okay, and now let's break that down a little bit. By doing what? What, what do they uniquely bring to the fire? Water. They bring water. Personnel. Personnel. Hose. Hose. SCB, all the PPE stuff, and probably a pump. Okay, so, you know, pump, water, and hose. That, that, you know, that, that really is, is, is the fundamental purpose of what an engine company has to do. And, you know, as Chief Bruno taught us, you know, the best water is always the fastest water. You know, uh, again, looking at that engine, you know, one of ours, you know, we had a bunch of these like you guys have got them. You know, how, how many ways can that engine get water on the fire? Uh, let, let's take a walk around your engine real quick. And everybody, well, you know, three or four is, is, is usually the stock answer you get. But what, what's the real answer? in terms of choices that that first in officer has uh, to get water on the fire. There's a trash line on the front. You know, again, just, you know, don't, don't get into, you know, the you know, trash line on the front. You got two or three cross lays right behind the cab, right? Got a deck gun up on top, okay? That deck gun can become portable down on the ground. If you've got a quint, you've got an aerial device on top of it. Coming off the back, you've got a two and a half or a larger line coming off the back. Maybe you've got a wide line. You've got a high-rise pack that can be plugged into a discharge. You know, uh, maybe you've got a blitz fire, one of those personal, you know, small monitors or things like that. So lo and behold, that officer's got eight or nine choices they can make, <coughs> in, in, excuse me, in order to meet that, that particular mission of, of getting hose and water pumped at the proper pressure on, on the fire, okay? Now, were any of you thinking primary search? Is primary search also a function of an engine company in your department? Or is the engine just a pure, hey, we're putting the fire out, someone else is going to worry about the search? Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, and I, I think, you know, for most of us, it's, it's search as you go. You know, maybe not, you know, to deviate directly from the fire attack. You know, most of us, again, that engine leads out its line to get water on the fire, to decrease the possibility of, of, of those hostile fire events that we're learning so much about through the different UL studies and things like that and all the different types of you know, shifts that we're trying to work on. Uh, again, if they've come across or, or they've got good recon that tells them we've got a victim inside the room, then absolutely that engine company you know, has to be able to, to, to work on that search. Now what about here? What about the truck company? And, and again, ignore the ladder on the top if you don't have one. Specifically, we're just talking about truck company functions. And, and uh, anybody remember from the, you know, the good old days in your Firefighter 1 training and things like that, what, what truck functions really were? Anybody here of Lover's U? Truck functions as Lover's U. That, that was something that you know, we, we were taught way back in the academy days, and you know, it's kind of stuck with us through there, that with or without the area ladder, the truck functions in a lover's you, uh, again, not in that particular order, but that's ladders, overhaul, ventilation, entry, egress, rescue, salvage, and utilities. And, and those were the functions that would kind of fall under the you know, a, a truck company work as, as, as folks went to work there. So just to, again, as part of the benchmarking, and again, we're looking at the first five minutes, can all five of those, I'm sorry, can all, all of those things be done in the first five minutes? Absolutely not, so you know, it's about Actions of opportunity. Again, we, we, we've heard that term, that, that term a couple of times before, but it's about those actions of opportunity in order to, to start to put, you know, put the trucks to work. Now, what about the first arriving officer? <clears throat> Their primary functions are what? Size up. Okay. What does what, what your initial radio report consist of? And again, I'm not talking about specifically what you say because that, that's something that's a little bit more locally, you know, locally drawn and locally driven. But what, what is that size up view supposed to be? We're, we're, confirming we can, uh, um, we're confirming what from the cab of the vehicle? What we can see from the cab, right? So, so basically we're telling everybody else what we can see from the cab of the vehicle. And then the second part to size up typically is what? We do a 360. We do that follow-up report that talks about the presence of a basement. It talks about any of the hazards we have across the, the back. It you know, takes a look at any of the other issues that, that we have as we go around the building and that. And those all become you know, primary parts of that. And so as we look at the officer, you know, again, primarily their job is to perform an adequate and you know, a concise size up looking at all the incident facts and probabilities, start to develop an incident action plan, 
And, and in our model, you know, just because that, that's, you know, we're, we're Chicago metro area and, and you know, we, we can throw a whole bunch of people and resources at it real quick. Our, our still alarms for a report of a working fire, we had 25 people dispatched uh, at, 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 you know, at the time of the call and most of them could get there in under 10 minutes. So we're, we're blessed with people, we're blessed with big red and black things that, that, that appear on the scene that go to work really quickly. So we're in a different type of model, again, as I said right from the beginning, that we can do a whole bunch of things simultaneously that other departments might have to do sequentially. Well, well, we'll check this off the box, we'll check this off the box, we'll check this off the box, and you know, keep moving through each of those areas as they go. So you know, the first in officer, obviously, you know, a lot, lot of stuff we have to talk about there. And then finally, in the context of what, you know, what, what, the, you know, what the battalion or the first arriving incident commander has to do, their job, many cases, uh, you know, I've heard it a whole bunch of different ways and things like that, but, but really it's about being able to slow the incident down. You know, being able to, when the truck goes into park, I'm sorry, when, when the Tahoe goes into park, being able to account for the people who are most threatened, meaning the ones who are in the hot zone, take a look at the incident action plan that they put together, and they either reinforce it or they reset it. And, and really, that, that's the initial decision package that the battalion and that first arriving incident commander has to do. They have to be able to take and, and set those things in motion. So looking at those first four you know, work groups, first engine, first truck, first arriving company officer, and first arriving incident commander, okay, that's the, the context of what the simulations that, that will start here in just a couple seconds are, are going to start to look there for us. Okay, <clears throat> so again, that 360, two parts, initial scene size up, and then the additional following factors that we have to take a look at. So most offensive SOPs, and, and, and Chief Buchanan said it very well yesterday, it, it, there's two playbooks on the shelf, one offensive, one defensive. Probably the offensive playbook is a little bit thicker because we've got a lot of different options and we've got the actions of opportunity, meaning a rescue mission versus a fire suppression mission, a room and content mission versus something that is now starting to extend to the structure or exposures and things like that. So, you know, the, the, the playbook for the offensive fire might be a little bit thicker than the defensive fire, which is primarily driven by, you know, exposure protection and trying to keep it in the area of origin and that. But how does that look for a initial incident action plan for your department? Can you accomplish that with your first alarm assignment responding to the incident? Can you get water on the fire, initiate a primary search, establish and confirm a positive water supply, get additional lines as needed, and again, additional lines meaning to support the objectives that are laid out and you know, hopefully the contingency to fall back on if something starts to go back, and then as needed, the ventilation and support piece that, that goes along there. Okay, that was our tactical worksheet. Had those, six, <clears throat> had those six boxes across the top, and the seventh box was on deck. And very simply, on the tactical worksheet, those were the words that were on the top, and the incident commander very simply wrote down the company number that was assigned underneath those functions. And until there was a company written underneath there, they had to keep committing resources to the incident until there was a company number assigned, at least one company assigned, to each one of those functions. And a bunch of other shorthand and things like that. But, but again, that, that became the last element of, of the seated incident commander, the IC2 position, to, to start to put that to work. So read that for just a sec there. Again, uh, you know, our, our timing is great with Bruno's uh, memory here today. What happens during the first five minutes dictates the next five hours. <clears throat> and what Bruno said a long time ago is we quickly learned that the command and operational action we took at the very beginning of the incident, meaning the first five minutes, determined how the whole event would turn out, meaning the next five hours. If we made mistakes, if we're out of position, if we skip the necessary steps, it would create a disadvantage at many times that we couldn't outperform for the rest of the incident time. And that, that's how critical those first five minutes of, of, of arrival are and, and why, why we're here to kind of talk about this here a little bit today. Okay, so again, Good beginnings have good endings. You know, if we pre-assign and we figure out, and again, I, I'm not about an SOP-driven fire operation, and, and obviously there's a lot of things that have to, have to kind of go in place, but if, if you look at this one just to start, there we go. This is uh, Chief Barker's guest house, I, I believe we can say here. So, had to do it, so, all right. So, is this a uh, rapidly changing situation? 
from, from what you're seeing? Again, you're, you're only, in a couple of these, we're only going to see one site here. What, what can you tell me about what, you're, what, what you see here? Okay. Okay, just, just light smoke from the front door. And, and again, just, just think about this in terms of your operation. Is this something that, that in your department you'd be, uh, would you stretch a line to the front door in this? Always? Is there an expectation, again, that, that's what this is about here, folks. Is there an expectation that we arrive on the scene, and again, it's a cheesy simulation here, so just, just kind of work with me a little bit on it. I've got light smoke showing from the front door in your organization, and again, this is you know, what we're taking back from this class to go back and talk with, you know, with, with, the, with the other members of our, our, our department here, is I would say at the very minimum to stay ahead of it. And that's what Chief Brunacini was trying to tell us, is that if, if we didn't do the same thing all of the time, we can't outperform the errors that, that, that may happen later down the road. So at the very minimum, I'm hoping that you would stretch a dry line to the front door. You can pack a dry line pretty quickly if, if it ends up just being food on the stove or something like that. But, you know, wouldn't we want to have that in place? You know, should we find something a little bit more, you know, a little bit more like this? Okay. What, what is that telling us? <clears throat> okay, that's the first five minutes. That went from what we just saw to this in the first five minutes of arrival on the scene. And if we went in with the pump can and a tick and just a set of tools to investigate, and lo and behold, we find that you know, we had a basement fire, we had a closed door type of a situation with just a little bit of a, you know, a lighter, lighter smoke showing from the front door, you know, completely different set of incident and action plans. So th this, if this was the arrival shot, what would we expect that engine to do in the first five minutes here? Position correctly, obviously the PPE things, all those you know givens and, and that that we have to you know that we have to have in place here, but here we're stretching a line, we're charging a line, we're securing a positive water supply, and we're working inside to put the fire out. Right? Okay. First truck arrives on the scene, uh, and again, if you have to use that lovers you type of acronym that we talked about before, what would we, what would what would we have as an expectation for the truck to do here? Okay. <clears throat> Is there a need for vertical ventilation here? Maybe not vertical ventilation right now, okay, but what, what, do I, what am I preparing for? I'm preparing for the possibility that I do need vertical ventilation. I'm also preparing for the event that we've got a victim or somebody we've got to get out through an elevation. If firefighters have to escape, if things start to change on the inside. So, you know, again, to, to set this up for success and not have a bad five-hour event, you know, as a result of it is, is why we have to take a look at these expectations in that. Okay, so let's look at this one here as a, as a real quick. <clears throat> and I'm going to let you guys do a little, a little size up on this one. First in officers on the scene now, they're delivering their initial radio report, getting out of the cab of the apparatus, starting to do our 360. And we're back to the front of the building now and we're ready to deliver the follow-up, you know, follow-up radio report. Okay. What do we want to do here? Does this become a fire attack situation or has this become a rescue operation? Did the size up in the 360 give you enough information to do that? What did you, you notice unique on the Charlie side of the building there? Okay, walk out basement. Okay, what else? I'm sorry? Okay, starting to move towards the back. You saw you know, a different color smoke you know, across the back. Is, is that a significant finding? Do you have to let everybody know on the fire ground? You know, so, so again, as part of that initial 360, you know, you're painting that picture for the rest of, rest of the arriving you know, mem members of the department coming. So in, in real time, this, this looks like this.
have this video as part of the PowerPoint that you'll download today. You're looking at the house in the center with the pickup truck in the driveway. There is an open garage. That's the occupant that you can hear hollering in the background. He went out to get the mail. <clears throat> he went out to get the mail and left food on the stove. And he left the door from the garage to the kitchen open. Okay, first arriving engine is there, and again, they have eight or nine choices to get water on the fire. Some are going to be more correct than others, right? Okay, so their objective here needs to be what? Is that, is that rapidly changing? Okay, rapidly changing, and, and obviously their job is to effectively lead out the line. And, and again, we're, we're not beating up the brothers and sisters here. We're just, you know, using this as an opportunity to talk here. What do you notice about the window at the Alpha Bravo corner on the Alpha side there? What can you tell me about that window and the significance there? It's blacked out, isn't it? So, so the volume inside that box is what? It's full, right? It's full of what? Fuel. And, and should that be part of that initial size up to estimate the additional available fuel that we have? Okay, that, that, that smoke is fuel. Okay. All right, first line is down again. You know, you're, you're, you know, we're we're going to stop this in just a sec. I just want to get you through the first five minutes of, of of these companies arriving on the scene. Perhaps some things we could have done done better here. Okay, we we see the engine getting its line ready to stretch. We saw the first arriving truck officer go to the front door, or he's going to come up here in just a second, and they they punch the front door open. Okay, D does that change as we said the pressure? In, inside there, you know, uh, again, we're establishing different types of flow paths that aren't going to work in our favor, and there's the end result. So our first inch and three-quarter line down here, you know, maybe in part because of the kinks uh, that, that didn't get completely laid out there, that inch and three-quarters get eaten up alive there. Okay, it, it's, uh, again, that, that's just burning gas inside the garage there, where, you know, again, just, just you know, burning gas is inside the garage. You can see the front door is open. And you see the second line now being stretched to the, to the uh, Alpha Delta side there to work down the Delta side, protect the exposure over there. Okay, you missed them there, but the truck company went in through the front door. We've got a couple of members inside through the front door and, and take a look across what do you see in the front door threshold now, right down at the base at the floor level. See the fire at the lower level down there? Great study in fire behavior. You know, why, you know, why, why is that now starting to, to lift and we're, we're having more ignition inside the living room there? Whether it was by the crews or if it was something by the heat and the other stuff inside there, you can see the front window has now failed across the front there. That's five minutes. That's five minutes from the time the first engine arrived on the scene and you saw that firefighter walking that first line out there.
lots changed from, from that time, right? You know, so again, you know, setting our standards and expectations and, and having that, you know, water on the fire, primary search, you know. <clears throat> and some other stuff that, that, that again you'll see, if, you know, again when you watch this video in its entirety when you get back home. Truck company, again, an SOP-driven organization here. Truck company laddered the Bravo side. There's a crew up on the roof opening up the roof on the Bravo side of the structure now. Uh, you can hear the saw running. You can see them up on top there. What do you think? That, did that first arriving engine meet the mission? Did, did they accomplish the expectations that we've, we've kind of set here? Well, they got, they got a line down. Okay. Did, did they get water, in the, uh, water on the fire? Well, may, maybe not in the right spot at the right amount for the right amount of time. Okay. So, so all of these things are, are measures and who, who ultimately do I have to take a look at here? I've, I've got to look at the incident commander in terms of what? Here's the incident action plan that was started, and I would have to say at this point it's, it's still a little bit ineffective, right? So, so what does our job have to be now from the command perspective? Got to call a timeout. Even if it stays in motion without the timeout, you've got to re re reinforce or kind of reset that, that, that action plan a little bit as it's going along there. So, you know, obviously, um, you know, ton, tons to learn, you know, ton, tons to learn from, you know, from, from, from that video there. Okay. Now, here's a real challenging day here for, for this particular department. These are uh, all the houses of very, very similar construction. Uh, from what I understand, this is the third time uh, in, in the department's history that they've had this type of a fire event in, in this same exact subdivision here. Uh, first arriving officer there, uh, he was out on a detail, arrived in a pickup truck, and he's waiting for his companies to get there, and this, this is a, you know, hurry up and wait type of a situation, but th this, this one moves kind of quickly. And, and from the first arriving engine and truck, uh, and again, we're going to focus back on the truck side of things now as the first one was an engine. Let's watch what happens here. And this is a crappy cell phone. This is like a flip phone video, so I, I apologize for the quality here. But uh, <clears throat> the initial fire building is the one with the garage open with the car inside. So as we suggested, the responsibilities of the first in truck Lovers, you, I've got an open garage and I've got a car inside. I might be making my initial incident action plan choices based on a high rescue pro uh, uh, profile here. Okay, if you look closely, you can see that the exposure on the delta side is on fire. And as you go up a little fo further, the exposure on the Bravo side is on fire. So you have three two-story single families on fire when the first engine arrives on the scene. Lightweight crap construction, you know, vinyl siding that, that is becoming part of the fuel package. You know, uh, again, once that melts it and started to catch on fire, we're in right up the top, in through the soffit, and we've got two attic fires, <coughs> excuse me, on the Bravo and the Delta. Again, with a high possibility for a rescue operation here. Okay. Is there survivable space inside the initial fire building? Survivable space, what do we mean by that term? That, that, that's something that we're kind of throwing out there right now. Okay. All right. If you look at the next exposure over, which is in front of that quint there, that is now on fire. So now they have their fourth structure on fire. And again, by total man, manpower, you know, about a dozen folks, about a dozen firefighters starting to go to work here. And you know we're you know we won't debate the effectiveness of the master streams or things there. It's just just a matter of you know just using this to, to kind of profile truck duties and that as we go. <clears throat> Got a little sequence of pictures here right right at the very end for you to take a look at, and you'll you'll see the prior to arrival. So there there's your occupant there. Bedroom fire extending up into the soffit. See how quickly that got up up into the attic area up there. 
how fast that burned through the exterior wall from the inside of the structure. You can see the delta exposure on fire there in between. Oop. I need to stop running there for you. Okay. Okay, and one more here. Okay. So here's what we want to be able to come up with. That's our template for company success. And again, we're, we'll have all these things and resource, you know, resources for you as we go along. For each of the companies that, that we've taken a look at, and again, we'll see, we'll see a couple more sims and, and a couple of uh, videos here for just a couple seconds for you. These are typically the things that we're going to want to you know, build into, into this process, that we're going to list, you know, again, by company, engine company, truck company, first and company officer, incident commander, list the tasks that they have to do, and to steal some words from NFPA, you know, the, the so that in the form of like a JPR, do this so this happens. Like stretch an initial attack line to put water on the fire, the, the, the so that piece of it. How do we communicate progress? Is, is that something that all, of, all the members of your department know how we communi communicate uh, progress? You know, the different types of benchmarks that have to occur. Do we hear water on the fire is a radio report? Do we hear the first in engineer perhaps saying, I've got a positive water supply established? Do we hear primary search all clear? Now, ventilation complete, no fire extension into the attic. You know, so, so always when we build you know, this process together, don't just look at the task, look at the outcome and specifically how we report the progress of how, the, how, the, how that's going to happen on, on the backside there. So that, that's the benchmarking part of the process. If there's any company level safety considerations that we have to have, we'll build those into the matrix a little bit as we go. And then finally, many of these things are going to have an individual element as well as a company element that we have to kind of measure. You know, so obviously what we mean with that is that you know, it, we all have to be the sum of, of everybody's individual performance level. If, if one firefighter is struggling down in their SCBA, that's going to delay the search. That, that's going to delay getting water on the fire. So, so the individual element sometime is going to delay the company's success, so we have to be able to draw that balance between, between each of those different areas in, in that as we go along. Okay, so starting from here, again, just uh, again, if you remember that, that there, what are the first three tasks? I'm going to need your help on this one here. What are the first three tasks for the first arriving engine on the scene of this particular house fire? First three things that we have to complete. <clears throat> size up so tell me what your size up is going to look like or sound like here valuable prizes may or may not be present for participating here today I've got some, okay got a fire okay there you go all right let's get a little better than that okay okay Okay, a whole bunch of little qualifiers, and, and again, your, your, your system is going to dictate specifically what you, know, what, what you have to say, but, but again, for that first two engine, what, what, what is their, their primary responsibility going to be here? Okay, water to the fire, set up a positive water supply. Is there opportunity to reinforce tactical operations by getting a second line down here? Did, by, by your definitions, uh, folks, do you, do you talk about the difference between a second line and a backup line? Is that something that terminology is, is, is a difference for you? Okay, in Chicago metro area, and again, just, just to give you an illustration of what I mean by that, uh, a second line always comes from the first engine. A backup line is from another water supply on another side of the building. And that, that, that is purely for the backup purpose of everything else go, go, you know, uh, you know, everything else going wrong. Okay. If, if we have a pump failure, if we have a water main break, if we have that five inch line, you know, getting charged in the bed and things like that. So, you know, we talk about a second line, the second line is typically coming from the first engine. If we have a backup line that's coming from another engine and another location, hopefully on, on another water supply. <clears throat> so in this context for this fire, how many line fire is this for your department? Working off that first engine, is this a three-line fire or more? How, how many would you say at least three lines down here? Okay, okay. so if, if you're saying three lines, because I set it up and gave you a fastball down the middle there, okay, where do we assign those three lines in the first five minutes of, of, of this engine arriving on the scene here? 
you know, and uh, again, I, we don't have to get into the big tactical debate here and things like that, but, but is there an opportunity here to <clears throat> uh, get water inside on, on, on the fire on the second floor? Okay. Is there fire in the attic, does it look like here? Okay, would that be a position for a second line? One, uh, again, actions of opportunity here. This, this, this might be a great opportunity here for a, uh, a transitional attack. You know, the right amount of pressure, GPA. Again, we get that line in the right position here. I think we can go a long way to slow the progress of fire and buy ourselves a little bit of time to get that line inside. Okay? So line to the main fire, whether it's transitional or it's inside. We won't debate that for, for today. So we've got one line in the fire room, either transitional or up the second floor stairs inside there. We've got a second line up the stairs trying to knock down by pulling ceiling, marrying up the truck and that coordinated fire attack. Uh, pulling some ceiling along the inside and getting some water up up in the attic up there. And what about the third line? Where, what, what's the position of the third line then? Okay. Think we got a walkout basement here? Probably. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Uh, again, maybe not a factor in the, in the overall you know, incident, but, but, but again, certainly something to be aware of as, as we're working along the inside. So, so maybe that third line initially is there as, as, as a backup, as I said before, so that if we have to reinforce the initial attack in the fire rooms up there at the Alpha Bravo corner, or if we have to reinforce the attack up in the attic to, to stop the progress of fire along the inside there. Uh, you know, again, <clears throat> good opportunities for, for each of them there. But the first arriving truck here. What's the first arriving truck going to do here? Is, is there a, a, actions of opportunity here for the first arriving truck? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Is there survivable occupied space inside this structure here? Remember, lovers you truck functions, lovers you ladders, overhaul, ventilation, egress, exit, rescue, ventilation, and salvage. Lovers you. So what assignments do we have for the first arriving truck here? Uh, again, make, make, your, you know, make your assumptions that we've got you know, a line working towards the fire to knock down the fire. We're establishing a positive water supply. You know, again, sequential in nature here, not simultaneous. So what are we going to have the truck do? Search. Okay. So if we're saying the truck is going to start to work on primary search, what search options do we have available and do we have to confirm in, in terms of what, what that company is going to do here? What, what's your search pattern going to look like here? Okay. Is there opportunity for vent and, you know, for VEIS here? Perhaps. Right-handed search, left-handed search, oriented person search, a rope search. How many of you would support that search with a charged hose line with companies on the inside? You know, uh, again, I, I, you know, I, I, I don't want to, you know, be putting people ahead of, ahead of a working fire without having the ability to protect themselves, right? Okay, so... Uh, again, you know, the decision-making piece of this is we have to predefine what those tasks are going to look like and, and, and who do I really, you know, I, I'm going to take Chris as my company officer here. What is his job with his truck company before they make entry and start to go through that door? We, we're going to decide what our search pattern is going to look like once we start crawling when we go through there or, or as a good company officer, what's, what should he be doing for us? Okay, you know, again, you know, crew check real quickly. We're going to take a left-hand search and let's work towards the bedrooms right away. We got a report of, of people inside the, the bedroom. We got a, repeat, a report of people in the house yet. Okay, so again, that, that's that crew resource management piece where, where again, we're, we're communicating those things together and, and taking and tying all those different pieces together. Okay, <clears throat> another perspective here. What about the first arriving pump operator? What do we want our first arriving pump operator to do here? Talked about it a little bit yesterday. Again, the drive safely piece is already, you know, again, we're not talking about that here today, but what, what are the two jobs of the driver operator here? Okay, get water. What, uh, no, let, let's talk about the two parts of that. What, what are the two parts of getting water? Okay, position it correctly. Okay, obviously, we, you know, make sure we, we you know, leave, leave it open. Initial attack water as well as what, what the other part of the water supply? The positive water supply. Water on the fire establish a positive water supply. Okay? Then what do we do with our pump operator after that? What, what, are, what are other tasks? And, and again, defining the expectations. After we get the line charged and we establish a positive water supply, what else can we do? 
Okay, can they assist in pulling a second line? Absolutely. Can they assist in you know, putting ladders and getting tools and equipment ready for the next arriving companies? Absolutely. What about the deck gun? <clears throat> if this was your fire and your first arriving engine was on the scene and I got there just a few minutes later, where would I see your deck gun positioned? Okay. Proactively, what I would advocate, again, within your system is you take a look with your pump operators and after they get their positive, I'm sorry, their water on the fire and positive water supply established, I'm thinking about that backup plan. Get up on top of the rig, get the deck gun up and point it towards where the firefighters went inside the building. Eliminate steps, guys. If we, if we eliminate the steps so that if something starts to go wrong and I have to harden the exit for the people who are inside there, all that pump operator needs to do now is what? Pull the valve and make sure we direct the stream instead of doing what? Because I know how most of you are going to keep your deck guns, your, your deluge guns up on top. You know, it's going to be pointed down in the pit or maybe in some cases you even have to pick it up and put it on the saddle, you know, you know drop the deadbolts in position, all those other good things there. So that, that, that's waste, you know, that the, the efficiency is to have it ready to go when you need it, ahead of when you need it. So, you know, again, when we define these expectations, you know, think about those safety systems. And, and I asked you about that safety system a little bit before. That would be another one that, that I'd want us thinking about, is that the backup plan to support and harden the exits for the people on the inside of the building are all taken care of for us there, okay? Uh, again, in our system, uh, I know the, you know, the hydraulic geeks and things like that would say it's probably not the best thing, and maybe even Akron or Elkhart and things like that probably wouldn't be uh, real happy, but we put uh, inline uh, gate uh, ball valves uh, right before the stack tips on top of the deck guns on the engine. And we kept them in the closed position so that all the engineer had to do is, is bring the gun up to, you know, 80 PSI, you know, you know, whatever the net discharge pressure we had to have it be, keep it in the closed position. They could get up on top of the apparatus because we don't have top mount pumps, everything is side mount. By the time they get up to three steps on top, it's at the right pressure. They open up the, uh, the discharge at the top of the gun there by, by that inline ball valve up there, and they're able to go to work. You know, again, with only a 500-gallon tank or 750-gallon tank like we had, uh, again, every precious second of water you know, it was important to us to make sure that, that, that we had those things in place there. Okay? All right, and last but not least, <clears throat> last but not least is the first arriving company officer here, or IC1. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of couple these last, last couple together as our, our time is almost out already. Uh, <clears throat> does the hair on the back of your neck stand up a little bit when you see this one? Yeah, what, what's, what's bugging you here? This is a, I, I, I see that and this is a dam. You know, you, al you almost get some goosebumps here just, just kind of looking at the possibilities here that, you know, is, is this someone who rushed home? because the report of a fire and, and flew into the front yard and jumped out and ran inside the structure. And in this case, that, that's exactly what happened here, is, is mom went out on a quick errand and the kids called screaming on the phone that the house was on fire. Mom flew back up the driveway, slammed it in park, jumped out of the car and, and ran in through the front door to try to get the kids out of the building there. Okay, so seeing just this with no one outside the structure what is our first arriving incident commander starting to think about now? Okay, so, so again, that, that, that's about that action of opportunity. This is a high profile rescue operation versus, as Eddie suggested yesterday, is it better to remove the people from the problem or the problem from the people? Okay, so, so in this situation, that, that officer, and this is where you know, the million dollar question, you know, another one of those there. You know, look, look at the smoke from the front door. Is it bugging you a little bit? Is, is, is that a, is, is what, what, what happens in the first five minutes if, if we don't take actions to intervene? If we don't change anything, what is this picture gonna look like in five minutes? Okay, from, from, from the folks present at the scene, their choice was to stretch the first line, put water on the fire right away before they made entry and they went in through the front door and they were able to grab the mom and the two kids who were trapped in the back of the structure. There was too much smoke for her once she located the two kids to bring them back through the front. She retreated to the back and, and had herself kind of barricaded in, in one of the bedrooms on, on the Bravo, <coughs> Bravo Charlie back corner of the structure. Okay, and a buddy of mine who, who, who ran this fire asked him and said, well, what, what, what if, uh, what, what, what's your company officer, you know, how'd they come to that decision? 
you know, what, what factors did they look at? And, you know, experience, you know, good experienced officer and things like that. And he said, probability wise, I was worried that if we went in and passed the fire because of the smoke that was present at the front door, if we went in and passed the fire and turned left to try to go, you know, and, and start to, you know, locate the victims on the inside, he was worried what? That he was going to be overrun by the fire advancing behind him. So in, in my book, that was the right call. Let's slow down the fire. And again, he said it, was, it wasn't any, any part of extinguishing the fire. He said it was a 15 second, open up the inch and three quarter, blasted it from, you know, from, from that, you know, right near the front of the, uh, the, the car there, went in through the front door, jumped inside, and they went in and had a, had a great three person rescue on, on you know, it, it is that initial attack. He said, you know, a million times I've, over, I've, I've ran that scenario and and, and to, to this officer's credit, and, and, and you know, just words that, that really kind of struck me is like, yeah, we're, we're, we're starting to get it now. He said, five years ago, there was no way I would have put water on that fire. Five years ago, my gut and all my training and everything told me I was going to do what? I would never, you know, never hit the fire from the outside. I would go in through the front door. If anything, I would turn to my right and I would throw some water, you know, towards anything if I saw it over there. And I would simply go to work said, five years ago, I could have killed my crew. But I've learned. I've learned to assess the conditions. And again, the evolving fire ground initial attack and, and that first five minute you know, thing that we're talking about here today, you know, hopefully allows us to, to do that. Yeah. No, well, he, he said that they were trying to locate, locate windows across the backside, and he said the visibility was so shitty, he said we just grabbed them and came back out through the front door there. Yeah, and, and you know, unfortunately, that's just, you know one, one of those, you know, one of those choices they had to make there. All right, here's my brother's fire. <clears throat> my brother was the uh, bat yeah, battalion in his, uh, in his community at this fire here. Uh, this is my attempt at the little simulation here. Six-unit apartment building. Each of, these, uh, each of these units, two bedrooms, you know, again, just, just your typical uh, you know, suburban Chicago uh, you know, condo apartment building there. Uh, he was on the scene first. He beat the engines on the scene. He was you know, out doing whatever he was doing on rounds, arrived on the scene, and this, this is what he had. A great luxury for the chief, you know, putting together the incident action plan, right? Because most of the time, what happens for, for the boss, if, if, if you've got a boss-driven system like that? They inherit what happens by everybody else who arrived on the scene, and they get their third or fourth, or you know, later into the incident here. So, what is what uh, what, what is the first arriving incident commander if, if they're, they're, they're ahead of the company have to start to do? Okay, they do they still have to do the size up. Do they still have to spot and you know in the appropriate position so they don't mess everything up themselves? Of course, right? All right, and then obviously they they start to call out the initial incident action plan. So an occupied six-unit apartment building, heavy fire on the second floor, Alpha Bravo side. Okay, what, do you, what do you think this initial attack operation is going to look like now? Okay, at least two lines, right? Is this, a, 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 again, another opportunity for uh, engine and truck and a coordinated, you know, NFPA 1700 is all about that, you know, kind of the coordinated fire attack operation here. What does the engine do? You know, trying to reinforce what we talked about through, through the morning here today. Hose, you know, again, you know, you know, pump water, you know, get water on the fire. What does the truck have to do here? Okay. Okay. With, probably with a charged line, get in and start to work primary. Where would be the first assignment that the incident commander is going to make for primary search here? Who's most threatened? Am I worrying about the people on one? Am I worrying about the people on two? Uh, to, to me, most threatened are the people who are going to be on three. And, and again, by you know, assigning that company up there. So a blatant direct ripoff from what Eddie talked about yesterday. How many people do we need to properly manage and handle this incident? Because again, speaking from the IC perspective, they have to have adequate resources on the scene. So just, just do your task math here. How many people are attacking the fire? Initially two. How many people on primary search? Initially two, okay. How many people do we have outside in a, in a standby in a backup position? Maybe getting that second line in place. Two more, okay, we're up to six if you're counting at home, right? 
got the incident commander. We've got the two pump operators, maybe the you know, third operator on the, on the vehicle there. So, so when, when Eddie, I, I, I was kind of watching the, you know, gauging the room a little bit when Eddie said, well, they, they need 17 people to staff the positions that they want there. And that's where that task math, and, and you know, a few of you are like, well, where the hell am I going to get 17 people? You know, that, that's, uh, like, like you said, a same-day service type of a model to get 17 people at, at some of our incidents. And, you know, so obviously, you know, tying all of it together, you know, that becomes, uh, you know, that, that incident commander's responsibility. Okay. <clears throat> and... All right, and finally, last but not least, this is what uh, the last resource that I want to have for us. Programming our companies for success, if we set those expectations, we've got to be able to give them the tools and the resources to help them make good decisions, okay? This little cue card here uh, is part of our officer training academy here, and, and this was just kind of built up to help our officers make the decisions based on that <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> that other document that, that I gave you. You've got both of these in, in the resource box for you guys to kind of take a look at here. And if we start this from the top and, and work our way down, and I know it's really, really hard to see in the back there, respond safely and, <clears throat> uh, again, tying everything together that we talked about here today. We respond safely and transmit the initial radio report. We perform the initial scene size up. We identify the location of the fire and potential immediate rescues identify any fire behavior cues which help us kind of go through the, uh, the the bag concept where the fire's been where it's at where it's going and that's what we're doing by reading that fire behavior inside we identify the opportunity for first water we determine our extinguishment plan meaning how many lines and what their objective and how we report that benchmark and how we take and tie that together our salvage opportunities and the other stuff that we have to do and then just tying it together, you know, always do our size up in 360. We coordinate ventilation. Uh, don't use a fog stream attack. Uh, you know, uh, no lightweight roof operations and being wind aware. You know, fundamentally, water good, air bad. You know, principles of a modern fire attack. Water good, air bad. The fastest water is going to be the best water as fast as we can start to reduce that temperature and get ourselves into a safe position, watching and mining those flow paths program is for success on the fire ground. Okay? All right. So any questions with two minutes to spare? So I, I know that was super, super fast and only a 50,000 foot view. That's why I'm giving you a ton of homework here. In your homework kit in the Dropbox, you'll have not just the PowerPoint and the videos that we saw today, but there are 20 other simulations in there that you can you know, take and, and work individually off your phones or, or just something within your group, just little MP4 uh, videos and things like that. You don't need any of the fancy simulation software to run them. They're just recorded in a little movie time for you guys. And you know, my recommendation for the follow-up is as a company, sit down, okay, we're the first arriving engine. What are the first three things we're going to do here? We're the first arriving truck. What are the first three things we're going to do here? And so on and so forth and get everybody talking about what the expectations and specifically what the positive outcomes are and the safety things that we have to have in place in order to make that an effective and, and, and efficient and safe fire ground for us. Okay, yes sir. Uh, Thetrainingofficer.com. Yeah, if you go to thetrainingofficer.com, I've got, you know, again, a few more cards left up here. Just go to thetrainingofficer.com and there's a, a, site's a little bit of a mess here. There it is, okay. Um, working on getting that cleaned up for you. Uh, but uh, just, just bear with me as I kind of rebuild my screw-ups on there, but uh, we'll, we'll have that ready to go for you. But again, just click on the Dropbox link. You'll get the PowerPoints, and then there'll be another resource folder. Just look under the Training Officer Help Center. And in the Training Officer Help Center, that's what I mentioned yesterday. There's 700 quick drills in there, and there's a folder called Size Up Exercises. That's what has all of the stuff here today. So I'll link it all directly off of today's class link for you while I'm on the ride to Big Sky today with Seth. I'll get all that stuff lined up so everything points in the right, right place for you guys as you go through there. Okay? So hopefully, uh, you know, met your expectation for the day today. I apologize for being rushed, but I want to make sure we finish on time to go join Eddie for, you know, the closing keynote here for the day today. Uh, it's been a great opportunity spending time in uh, you know, a little brotherhood and sisterhood with you guys here. It's been a, a very, very professional conference with a bunch of dedicated professionals who uh, I'd, I'd, be, I'd be blessed to have you guys be, be firefighters that I could call uh, you know, co-workers and things like that. Uh, great operations that I see out here. So thank you for what you do for your communities. Thank you for what you do with each other. And 
Uh, keep an eye on each other and keep them safe. So thank you very much for your time here today, guys, and power Thanks. <laughs>